Good morning. My name is Eleanor Cummings and I'm the Marketing Manager at Kites. I'm delighted to welcome you to our HR Breakfast Club webinar in recognition of International Women's Day. Our speakers today are Kevin McKenna, Claire Treacy and Jake McManus. We're also delighted to welcome our guest speaker, Ali Hutchinson, who is the HR manager at Hertility Health. This is a startup providing access to women's health for everyday women inside and outside the workplace. As always, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function and we'll answer as many as we can at the end. Also, if you have any questions following the seminar, please feel free to contact members of our team and we'll also be following up with a copy of the slides. First, I'm going to hand over to Jake McManus for a legal update. Thanks, Eleanor, and good morning, everyone. We see and hear a lot about the gender pay gap. However, pay is not the only inequality that exists in the workplace. Research has found that the UK has a large gender health gap, which is the largest in the G20 and the 12th largest globally. This is a subject which is increasingly being spoken about and gaining a media attention, so I doubt it's the first time that you've heard about it. So what do I mean exactly by the gender health gap? It includes, for example, differences in the prevalence of disease, health outcomes, access to healthcare. It also includes, for example, differences in monitoring of healthcare and mental health. As a result of the increase in awareness of the gender health gap, the government is taking action to tackle the inequalities in health between men and women. There are two bills in particular that are currently progressing through Parliament, which I'm going to discuss with you today. And these are the Neonatal Care Leave and Pay Bill, and second, Protection from Redundancy, Pregnancy and Family Leave Bill. I'm going to explain to you how the law will change and what employers should do in response to these new laws. So the first bill I want to look at is the Neonatal Care Leave and Pay Bill. We mentioned in, we mentioned in our last HR Breakfast Club that this bill was in the pipeline and it's now actually passed through the House of Commons and it's currently making its way through the House of Lords, which means that it should become law. So what's the current situation? Well, at the moment, there's not any leave of it available that specifically covers neonatal care, which is the type of care for a baby born prematurely or who is sick. Once a baby's born and employee's maternity leave starts, this means that if the baby's born prematurely or is under neonatal care, then maternity leave has already started, even though the baby's in, still in hospital. Fathers can take statutory paternity leave, that's two weeks. Otherwise, parents will have to use their holiday entitlement or take unpaid leave. So why is this bill being introduced? Well, as there's currently no legal entitlement to neonatal care leave, research has found that some parents can be financially burdened with their premature or sick baby when they're in hospital. And in fact, research has found that half of all parents would have liked to have taken more parental leave, but couldn't afford to take longer off work. And in some cases, parents find that they have to return to work at a time when their baby is either still in hospital or at an earlier development stage. The same research also found that parents who can't afford to take more time off work may suffer from stress due to the reduced bonding time. Employers may find that, that this impacts productivity and increases levels of sickness absence. So what's being proposed in this bill to tackle the issue? Well, in short, the bill introduces two new rights. First, neonatal care leave and second, statutory neonatal care pay. The new law will allow parents to each take up to 12 weeks of paid leave in addition to other leave entitlements such as maternity and paternity leave. This new neonatal care leave will be a day one right, so that means that the leave will be available to employees from their first day of work, and the leave must be taken before the end of a period of at least 68 weeks beginning with the date of the child's birth. However, at the moment, we do not know the maximum amount of leave that the employee can take as, as that's still to be decided. In terms of requirements, it will apply to employees who are parents of babies who are admitted into hospital 
and receiving neonatal care up to the age of 28 days and who have a continuous stay in hospital for seven full days or more. And in respect of pay, only those employees who have worked for the employer for at least 26 weeks and who have earnings not less than a lower earnings limit will be entitled to statutory neonatal care pay. It's likely that the lower earnings limit will be the same as other types of family leave, which is currently £123 a week, and that's before tax. So employees will have rights during and after neonatal care leave that are broadly equivalent of other forms of parental leave, like paternity uh, or shared parental leave. This includes protection from dismissal or detriment as a res result of having taken leave. So how will this bill affect you as employers? It's expected that implementation will take, about, will take place in about 18 months after the bill being passed. The benefit of this is that it provides employers with plenty of time to prepare. You may wish to update your workplace policies in advance, for example, by introducing a specific policy to neonatal care leave in the same way that you may have policies for other forms of family leave. Of course, you may choose to introduce paid leave for neonatal care, even though there's not currently a legal requirement to do so. If your business already offers company pay for family leave, then it's a good idea to provide company pay for neonatal care leave to avoid any com uh, complaints. So I will now move on to look at the second legal update today, which is protection from redundancy, pregnancy and family leave bill. Again, like neonatal care leave, this bill has already passed through the House of Commons and is making progress in the Lords, which means that it should become law. Currently, an employee can be made redundant during pregnancy or maternity leave, providing that there's a genuine reason for that redundancy and they have not been selected for redundancy because they are pregnant or because they're on maternity leave, as that would be an automatically unfair dismissal, as well as being unlawful discrimination. If a woman is selected for redundancy whilst on maternity leave, then the employer must offer the employee suitable alternative work, even if the employee does not ask for it. And this offer must be made before the end of the current employment. The alternative work must take effect as soon as the previous employment ends, and it must not be on substantially less favorable terms than the previous role. So why is this bill being introduced? Well, this protection does not currently extend to, to pregnant employees. Research by the Equality and Human Rights Commission and feedback from a government consultation found that thousands of women believe that they were made redundant due to their pregnancy or maternity leave. The government have said um, that this bill is therefore being introduced to extend the protection from redundancy to pregnant women in an effort to improve job security, to keep more people in work and to prevent workplace discrimination. So in short, the bill extends current redundancy protections from the moment the employer was informed of the pregnancy through to six months after maternity leave has finished. The bill also extends equivalent protections to those taking adoption leave or shared parental leave. Whilst the bill itself does not specify details of any protect protections, it does give power to the Secretary of State to extend the current regulations offered to women on maternity leave to cover a longer period of time during or after a period of pregnancy. The bill also gives the Secretary of State the power to extend protections for those on adoption leave or shared parental leave in the same way. We may not know the specific protections, however, the government has pledged to ensure that redundancy, the redundancy protection period applies from the point that the employee informs their employer that they are pregnant, whether that be orally or in writing. They've also pledged to extend the protective period for six months as soon as maternity leave ends. So in reality, the protected period will last for about 18 months once the baby's born. The same approach will be taken for adoption leave and a similar approach taken for shared parental leave. I guess the practical effect of this bill will be that pregnant women or new parents are first in the queue for suitable remaining jobs in a redundancy situation, which can't be on substantially less favorable terms. So what do you need to know as employers? Well, firstly, it is proposed that the bill will take effect two months from the day that it's passed. However, as I mentioned earlier, the bill does not cover um, a time frame for when exact details of the redundancy protections will be given. So I think the main takeaway is that once the law is introduced, you should prioritise pregnant women who are at risk of redundancy when it comes to offering suitable alternative roles, 
in addition to those employees on maternity leave, as is the case now. Once the law is passed, you should also prioritise those employees who have returned from maternity and adoption leave, and likely those coming back from shared parental leave. It may seem obvious, but make sure you're making a record of the relevant dates, for example, six months from the employee's return, so that you're aware of the protected period when overseeing any redundancies once this law is passed. As I mentioned earlier, the protected period starts once you become aware of the pregnancy, even if it's not in writing, so don't wait for the written confirmation from the employee. As soon as they tell you that they're pregnant, the protected period will start. It's also worth considering making changes to any relevant workplace policies that you have to reflect those new protections um, that should be introduced under this bill. For example, um, any family leave policies that you have or redundancy policies. Finally, and is always the case, managers should be trained on managing redundancy for employees who are pregnant who, or who are on maternity leave to ensure that the process is fair and to prevent any conflict. So that's all from myself today. So I'll now hand you over to Claire. Hey, morning, everybody. Thank you for that, um, Jake. So today, um, this morning, I am going to um, talk about some of the health conditions impacting women and how as employers you can, um, you can support basically women experiencing these conditions. So I'll mention a few tribunal cases which are focused on women's health conditions. Um, but in particular, though, I'm going to be talking about endometriosis and polycystic ovary syndrome. And then uh, finally, I will um, just touch upon uh, menopause briefly in terms of the recent updates um, from the government initiatives to support uh, menopausal women in the workplace. So according to the most recent data, 72.2% of women aged 16 to 64 are in work, which is around 15.5 million women. We are starting to, say, to see a shift um, in women's health and reproductive rights becoming more important. And that's to both employers when trying to attract more women in the workplace and employees who want more support from their employers. And there's also uh, definitely been an increase in legal issues on this topic. Um, in terms of um, the shift, I think part of that shift to focus on women's health issues and reproductive rights can be put down to this 10-year uh, action plan to support the health and well-being of women and girls in England. Um, this was published by the government in July 2022 and is referred to as the Women's Health Strategy for England. The key objectives of the action plan have been um, to make women feel able to speak openly in the workplace about their health um, and feel confident they will be supported by their employer and colleagues. Uh, responses to this um, report, so the call for evidence, recorded that only one in three women felt comfortable discussing health issues in their workplace. And around one in two said that their current or previous employer had been supportive regarding health issues. Another objective of this um, action plan is for women to feel supported at work when experiencing these health issues um, or women's health issues. So things such as period problems, endometriosis, uh, fertility treatment, miscarriage and the menopause. And finally, they also want women's colleagues um, and employers to feel better equipped to support them by the provision of information and awareness. So if I move on from this um, action plan, just to talk first of all about um, endometriosis. Uh, this is a condition that only affects women. And for those of you that don't know much about it, it's a condition where a tissue similar to the lining of the womb starts to grow in other places. Um, so it grows in places such as the ovaries and the fallopian tubes. And whilst it does grow outside of the uterus, the tissue responds to the menstrual cycle each month and it bleeds. And this bleeding can cause pain, inflammation and scarring, and it can damage the um, pelvic organs. So I've put some of the symptoms on the slide and you'll see that it impacts one in 10 women with around 1.5 million women currently living with the condition in the UK. And then, yeah, also, as it says on the slide, according to a report by the old Parli party parliamentary group on endometriosis in 2020, the condition cost the UK workplace, um, the, sorry, the UK economy 8.2 billion a year in loss of uh, work and healthcare. So better support in the workplace really could make a big difference to not only the employee, but also the employer's own productivity and profitability. 
And then I said the other condition I would talk about is um, polycystic ovary syndromes, otherwise known as PCOS. Again, it's a condition that only affects women and it affects um, the way the ovaries works. Uh, so it's where the ovaries contain a large number of harmless follicles that can be up to eight millimeters in size. And these follicles are underdeveloped sacs in which eggs develop, but are often unable to release the eggs, which means ovulation um, doesn't take place. And again, there is a variety of symptoms and I have put them on the slide. And similar to endometriosis, it does impact um, one in 10 women in the UK. And it is one of the leading causes of fertility problems in women. It can also cause um, long term health conditions um, such as heart disease, womb cancer and type 2 diabetes because of the hormone imbalance and changes to the amount of insulin in the body. Uh, so in terms of the legal implications, though, um, of these two conditions, under the Equality Act, there are certain illnesses such as cancer and HIV, which are automatically deemed to be a disability and therefore give automatic protection from discrimination to workers suffering from such illnesses. Where, however, the vast number of illnesses don't automatically qualify as a disability under the Equality Act. Instead, um, the individual must satisfy the definition of a disabled person, which is contained in the Act. And that's the definition that I've put on the slide. So a person has a disability if they have a physical or mental impairment and the impairment has a substantial and long term adverse effect on the person's ability to carry out normal day to day activities. And this is the camp that endometriosis and PCOS falls into, um, which means that um, employees with these conditions need to be able to prove that they satisfy this legal definition if they're bringing a claim um, for discrimination. So in terms of the conditions, they are both physical impairments as they impact women's reproductive organs. They are both long term because unfortunately they are incurable. So that means at the very least, they satisfy um, two parts of the legal definition of a, a disability. Whether they substantially affect the women's ability to carry out day to day activities, though, that very much depends on each case. But it is important to note that a tribunal will look at the impact on the women without any medication or treatment. So where employees with these conditions satisfy the legal definition of a disabled person, it gives the employee the protection from being discriminated against on the grounds of her endometriosis or PCOS. And as the employer, you will have a statutory duty to make reasonable adjustments and to ensure the employee is not treated less favourably because of um, her condition. Uh, failing which the employee could potentially bring a claim in the employment tribunal. They, these conditions, endometriosis and PCOS, have actually been part of employment tribunal cases on a number of occasions in recent years, and this slide uh, sets out some of those cases. The first being um, Monaghan against ASA International Limited. So this is a case actually in the Scottish employment tribunals where the tribunal had to decide whether the claimant's endometriosis did satisfy that legal definition of a disability, as the respondent denied um, that it did. In this, in this case, the claimant was successful. Her symptoms were considered to be substantial because they included heavy bleeding for two days a month, in addition to abdominal pain, bloatedness, fluid retention, and premenstrual tension syndrome. And the condition also, sadly for the claimant, actually caused tissue to grow on her bladder and bowel, and this also resulted in bleeding and pain for her. In terms of her ability to carry out day-to-day -day activities, she was quite badly affected by anxiety. So she struggled to leave the house because she was reluctant to go out because of the risk of bleeding. Um, also, because the pain had been so debilitating for the claimant, uh, she became quite angry and irritable, uh, which in turn caused the breakdown of her relationship with her partner. And her daughter actually moved out for a time um, because of the um, irritability that she was showing. So as a result, in this case, um, the tribunal had very little trouble in determining that this um, claimant did satisfy the legal definition of a disability because of her endometriosis. 
Uh, the second case on the slide, Scotland against British Airways um, PLC. The claimant in this case was paid £2,000 following British Airways' decision to dismiss her as the decision to dismiss did take into account sick days the claimant had had because of her endometriosis. Um, the sick days that she had taken were to help her recover from surgery. She had had to mitigate the symptoms of her endometriosis. And British Airways, in this case, actually accepted that because of the impact the claimant's um, condition had on her ability to carry out day-to-day -day activities, she was a disabled person for the purposes of that legal definition. And this is quite similar to the third case on the slide, Sutton against Sheffield Children's NHS Foundation Trust. Again, the respondent agreed that the claimant's endometriosis and hormone-related migraines amounted to a legal disability. The claimant then succeeded with her tribunal claims. Um, but in this case, the claimant was employed as a nurse and she'd been employed for 20 years and until her dismissal um, under the trust attendance management process. And similarly to the British Airways case that I just mentioned, the trust had failed to discount sick days the claimant had had due to her endometriosis and hormone-related migraines when they carried out their absent management process. And this meant that the claimant was dismissed as a result of having days off ill to manage her disabilities. So in those two cases, what the employer should have done is discount those days and only look at the days off ill that were not related to the claimant's disabilities, um, such as um, sick days potentially for a cold or a stomach bug. And this would have been a reasonable adjustment to their absent management process. Uh, so just finally on the case law, um, in Divers against Balliard Hair and Beauty Salon, the tribunal found that the claimant was a disabled person by reason of her polycystic ovary syndrome. The symptoms of the claimant's PCOS were considered to have a substantial impact on the claimant's ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities because the pain for the claimant at the start of her periods was so severe that she actually had difficulty getting out of bed, uh, she would be sick and at times she would faint. Her periods also lasted a lot longer than is normal. So she satisfied that legal definition and then she actually went on to win her disability discrimination claims as well because the tribunal was satisfied that her dismissal on the same day that she spoke to her employer about her PCOS was treatment arising from that disability. And as a result, she was awarded uh, £4,000 by the tribunal. So how can you, as... Um, and employer support staff with endometriosis and PCOS. Well, educating yourselves, as it says on the slide, um, coming on webinars such as this to educate yourselves on the condition, to better understand what effects this can have on employees and the support they may need is definitely a good, a good step. And hopefully it's information that you can pass down into the business. Also potentially providing training uh, to staff, particularly managers and HR, about how to manage health conditions in the workplace. You might also consider introducing a policy um, to deal with reproductive issues in the workplace. Um, such a policy, though, should set out the business's approach to dealing with workplace issues relating to women's reproductive health. But as always with policies, it's vitally important that they are actually um, practiced within the, within the culture of the business rather than um, just written down. And that yeah leads into encouraging that culture of openness, which I think can no doubt be one of the most important steps for businesses. Um, so it's to tackle really the stigma around talking about reproductive health issues, to shift from employees feeling embarrassed and feeling guilty or fearful of any repercussions to feel like actually they can have open conversations with their manager, their peers or HR. And once you've um, established that um, culture of openness, hopefully then um, employees feel able to talk about their health and this will allow you as a business to consider reasonable adjustments that the employee might need. Um, so that's reasonable adjustments to make sure that health isn't putting them at a disadvantage. But it is important that um, any adjustments that you discuss are bespoke ones. So you might consider things such as allowing time off for medical appointments um, so that employees don't have to use their annual leave. Uh, you might consider absences um, relating to these conditions separately to other sickness absences. 
and also potentially offering a change in working hours, um, whether that's temporary or permanent. And it could also be a change in shift pattern or break times, as well as a change in actual working patterns so that you offer hybrid or home working. Um, once you've got those reasonable adjustments in place, though, it is important that you have regular check-ins with your staff as their needs might change. Um, and I think it's always a good idea to agree with staff how regularly you will check in with them so that they can't accuse you of being overbearing, but equally they can't accuse you of um, not being supportive enough. And then uh, finally, as it says on the side, offer support services. So if your company has the benefit of an employee assistant program, then you can direct your staff to that or you can direct and please to external sites or organisations for help and support. So I'll leave um, endometriosis and PCOS there and just briefly touch on menopause in the workplace. I won't talk about that as much because we did actually do a full webinar on that for International, um, or sorry, World Menopause Day, I should say. And uh, that webinar is still available on the Kites YouTube channel um, if you do want to go back and watch it. Uh, there have been some updates, though, which are um, worth me mentioning now. And this was as a result of the um, report um, published in July 2022. Um, and this report was published by the Women and Equalities Committee, um, which included a number of recommendations for the government um, to help support women um, going through menopause in the workplace. So one of the recommendations was the appointment of a menopause ambassador. This was someone that would champion good practices. Um, so, for example, by working with unions and advisory groups to encourage good practice and to give guidance to employers on the issues of menopause in the workplace. The report also recommended the production of model menopause policies. It also restated the need to make it a right to be able to make a flexible working request from the very start of employment, rather than requiring employees to have first been employed for at least 26 weeks, as is currently the case. The government did say back in March last year that they would um, make changes to the legislation about flexible working to allow it to be a day one right, but this hasn't um, happened yet. The report also recommended trialling menopause leave. Um, it was recommended that the government actually trial it with a large public sector employer. The idea being that if you had this type of leave, it would prevent women from being forced out of work by rigid sickness policies. And then, um, yeah, finally, probably the one that you may have heard of that probably got the most attention is that the committee recommended menopause should be a separate protected characteristic under the Equality Act. So just like we have uh, disability, age, sex as a separate protected characteristic, they wanted menopause to be one. The government did, they did respond to this in January, uh, just gone. And they didn't, um, there, and I guess, again, the one that got the most headlines is they didn't agree to make menopause a separate protected characteristic under the Equality Act. So what that means is that women will still have to bring claims of either sex, age or disability discrimination if they are pursuing menopause related discrimination claims. They also confirm that they won't be introducing that model menopause policy that was recommended. And they did, though, they did um, take on some of the recommendations. So they did agree that a new menopause employment champion will be appointed. They haven't said when this will happen, but the idea is that this person will work with employers on menopause workplace issues and report to DWP ministers. So having that champion should help to ensure that menopause um, in the workplace actually remains on the public policy um, agenda. They did, um, again, restate their commitment to updating the, the law on flexible work and requests. But as I've said on the slide, we still haven't got a date for that yet. Um, this is, of course, quite different to the Labour Party's position, um, position who last week announced their plans to support women in the workplace if they win the next election. And um, their plans actually include requiring large companies, so companies with 250 or more staff, 
to publish and implement menopause action plans detailing how they are supporting women with menopause at work. So I think it's probably fair to say that quite a few organisations were disappointed by the government's response to the recommendations. Um, but there is no doubt that menopause and um, women's health generally in the workplace remains on the government's agenda. And so businesses that um, were to educate themselves on the issues and obviously encouraging that culture where employees feel able to talk about their health will be putting their business and obviously therefore employees in the um, best position. As that was everything I was going to talk about, so I will um, hand over back to Kevin, but thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Claire. Um, and uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin McKenna, and I head up the uh, employment uh, law team here at Kites. And uh, in my section, I'm going to talk to you, uh, hopefully in fairly brief uh, terms, uh, running through the uh, IVF and the uh, and the law. Um, and it's an area that um, uh, affects many people. It's clearly not um, spoken about in in many instances. Um, uh, but it affects uh, one in six uh, couples, or to put another way, about three and a half million people in the UK. Uh, and it's uh, a growing uh, trend uh, because it, there is a, an inherent link um, between infertility and age. And as people are tending to have uh, children later in life, and infertility is becoming um, uh, more of an issue. So... Um, so too, I suppose, are the uh, are, are the um, protections around that. But what is the current protection for um, people who are going through um, uh, IVF uh, treatment? Well, the answer to that is fairly simple in the first instance, in that there is no current specific legal protection for people who are uh, who are going through IVF treatment. There's no right to um, pay for time off. There's no right to unpaid time off. There's no right to be accompanied to treatment um, by your partner. Uh, so where are the protections? Well, the protections exist then in all of the other existing legislation uh, that we have or in your contracts but to, um, and, and policies. But we're going to stick for the moment in relation to the law, to the existing law. And so those protections principally come through those areas, through those protected characteristics of um, sex and, uh, and pregnancy. Uh, and there there are splinter issues about when does a person uh, become um, pregnant? When does pregnancy occur? And then it's also not straightforward as to where uh, and when sex discrimination um, happens. So we'll come back to that because the, uh, we do have the assistance of some cases on uh, on those issues. Uh, it, might, it might be that it comes under the definition of um, of disability, um, disability or sorry, infertility uh, is classified by the World Health Organization as a disease of the reproduction system, which results in disability. And so you think, well, then we are on our way to establishing that that might be a, um, a protected characteristic or at least come within the definition of disability. But in real life, of course, many cases of uh, infertility uh, may not have a distinct medical cause or might be um, unexplained. Um, and when we're looking at whether infertility meets the definition of disability, then we're going through the same tests that Claire uh, mentioned in, in her talk. So does the person have a physical or mental impairment? Is the effect substantial? Is it long term? And does it have that impact upon your ability to carry out normal day to day activities? And so cutting to the chase on that, it's likely to be the case that in many instances you would get through those first three tests that I mentioned there, um, perhaps with relative ease, that there would be a, a physical impairment or perhaps a mental impairment and um, or a physical impairment with, that has a substantial impact. It has a long term impact. But the area where these uh, issues tend to fall down is perhaps on the impact upon ability to carry out normal day to day activities. Um, and there are no uh, cases, or at least no cases that I've been able to find uh, on that. I think what there is, is perhaps the link between infertility and uh, instances of mental ill health. So there are strong links between infertility, for instance, and depression. And so it may be that there are instances where there, where disability protection uh, applies, but not because of the 
infertility per se, but as a result of a mental impairment caused by the infertility. Um, so as I say, uh, no cases that I'm aware of there, so we'll leave that uh, there at, at this point. Age, I say, as a, as a possibility, simply because uh, of that inherent link that I mentioned between um, age and uh, infertility. Um, but not only are there no cases on uh, on age, uh, there doesn't seem to be very much in the way of other legal discussion about that. So, uh, and it may also be a function of the combination of age and gender. So for today's purposes, we'll leave that there. What we'll come back to is the relevant case law that we have had and that gives us some assistance, I suppose, in relation to, um, in relation to uh, infertility um, treatment. And um, the first and perhaps principal case on this is, is a case of Meyer and um, Bacchari und Konditori Gerhard Flockner, uh, which is the first use I've got out of my GCSE uh, in, in German. Um, and this uh, is a, a case that uh, affected a, a, a lady, Sabine Meyer, in Austria. So this is a case that went to the uh, European Court of Justice, uh, occurred and first at uh, first instance in the Austrian courts. And this was uh, a case that involved uh, a, a woman that was undergoing IVF treatment, uh, underwent some hormone treatment, uh, which made her ill. She had a pe period of, uh, of um, sick leave. Um, and while she was on sick leave, on day three of her um, sick leave, she was dismissed by her employer. Two days later, uh, she underwent the implantation of the fertilized eggs and the key question in this case was whether uh, this was pregnancy related because it would have given additional protection to that person under um, Austrian law and so that's the question in this when does pregnancy arise and there was a specific answer that was given in um, it, in quite an interesting judgment that is worth while uh, reading if, you, if you've got the time uh, which talks um, about the books of Balzac and the paintings of Goya, but also then focuses in at some point on, on the point at which it says the protection applies. And that's um, where there has been a follicular puncture and the transfer to the woman's uterus of the ova removed by way of that follicular puncture immediately after their fertilization. So it was in this specific point that the court said, that dismissing a woman essentially because she was undergoing that important stage of in vitro fertilization was direct sex discrimination. And therefore there was no need for a male comparator. So in um, a Sabine Mayer's case, she uh, didn't have the protection because at the point of her dismissal, she was not for these purposes, um, she was not pregnant. And the court said that what was really important is that there was legal certainty because if you, could be technically pregnant when uh, there had been fertilization outside of the body because many national laws will allow for um, the retention of those fertilized eggs for in Austria up to 10 years, then that would give protection for longer than, uh, than would ever have been intended and would lack legal certainty. So it didn't give this claimant the protection under that pregnancy element, but set, returned it to the Austrian court saying, but less favorable treatment could still constitute sex discrimination. So it's not the um, end of the road in terms of possible protection. <clears throat> that was then followed uh, in the uh, UK courts by an um, ECJ, um, uh, by uh, when the um, by the EAT, the Employment, I Employment um, Tribunals endorsed um, that decision. The EAT um, emphasised that pregnancy related illness aside, gender specific illness did not itself give rise to um, special discrimination protection. It had previously been recognised by the ECJ that male and female workers are equally exposed to illness. And if a female worker is dis dismissed on account of sickness absence in the same circumstances as a, as a man would be, then there is no um, sex discrimination. So Maya was not authority for the proposition that any less favourable treatment of a woman on the grounds that she was receiving IVF treatment constituted sex discrimination. I've mentioned on there the case of um, Caravadra because it's the uh, other uh, case that involves um, uh, IVF treatment 
but on, on my reading of it, I, I would say that that's more of a pregnancy case uh, rather than a uh, rather than IVF treatment uh, matter. Um, <clears throat> so that's what the um, uh, present position is, or I say that the, the present position is that if um, treatment is unsuccessful, then a woman's protection will end two weeks after the end of any pregnancy. So a pregnancy test is taken place two weeks typically after the implantation of an embryo, and the woman will have special protection for those two weeks. And if the pregnancy test is negative for a further two weeks from that time. So that's the current position. Uh, there's possible future change. There is a fertility treatment employment rights bill, uh, which is uh, going through the legislative process now. It's early in that stage. Um, uh, the second reading is on uh, the 17th of March um, uh, uh, this year. Um, the intention of that legislation, if it's passed, will be to give those rights that we're talking about, rights to time off, rights to pay, uh, applying those rights also to agency workers and the rights to accompany uh, a partner for um, fertility treatment with uh, a ratcheting up of compensation, for instance, if you're, if you're not being given that time off where you might where the compensation might be, for example, that it doubled the pay that you've lost. Um, so there um, are some future changes there. In terms of the practical steps, I mean, in summary, the practical steps are, are largely the sorts of um, things that Claire has spoken about in relation to those other areas that we've spoken about. It's, um, it, it's increasing um, the information that's out there for, uh, for employees and workers. Most workplaces don't address the matter at all. Most workplaces um, don't have a policy. Uh, there is little in the way of awareness and support. IVF is uh, frequently unsuccessful and it's frequently not um, spoken about so uh, that does I suppose place some greater emphasis on the employer to make information and awareness and support more accessible. Um, uh, it's also an area where there is discussion just in the same way again that Claire had spoken about about the role of fertility ambassadors about providing training and I suppose the growing area of flexible working to allow for some of the uh, the factors that we've took that, that, that are likely to occur in relation to um, treatment um, and so on. Uh, so that's uh, my uh, whistle stop um, tour through um, the law in relation to IVF so far as it affects employment. I realise that there's lots of other um, areas of um, uh, where um, where discrimination perhaps can apply in relation to, to treatment. Um, but in trying to um, further that, at least that one area of awareness and support, um, I'm now going to pass on to um, Ali, who I think is going to um, help us uh, try and learn a little bit more. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my slides. Um, I'm a bit of a tech grandma, so I hope this works. Is that, can you guys see that? Is that okay? Yeah, I presume no news is good news. So, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, oh, somebody's, yes, it's fine. Thank you. <laughs> it's always talking into the abyss. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, thank you very much um, for having me on this um, webinar. I really appreciate it. Um, my name's Ali Hutchison. I am coming to you from a company called Hotility Health. And we are a women's reproductive health company um, and we are here to revolutionize healthcare for everybody. Um, being part of a revolution is exhausting but we are trying really hard to make women's healthcare more um, fair and designed for everybody. So as I said, Hotility is a startup. We were created in February 2019 by um, three founders. We have Dr. Helen, Dr. Natalie, and they are both ovarian biologists. They are women's reproductive health specialists. Helen is head of uh, the MSc program at UCL, delivering reproductive health education to all of our students. Um, and Dr. Natalie is an ovarian transfer specialist. Uh, they founded Hotility along with Dr. Helen's completely identical twin sister, Deirdre, who I still can't tell them apart. Uh, and Deirdre is a commercial lawyer. And the three of them started Hotility because despite all their kind of scientific knowledge between them, they weren't completely kind of clued up on their own hormone health 
their own fertility status and um you know if they don't know what what's going on in their own bodies what hope have us mere mortals got so they introduced fertility back in february 2019 like I said, I'm the people manager um, at Hotility, and if you have any questions or want to talk anything through, uh, please feel free to get in touch. Um, my email address is pretty simple to remember, but I'm sure we can send it around afterwards as well. So what I want to do is start by showing you um, our award-winning uh, brand film, um, which shows you our slightly disruptive nature towards women's health um, and their reproductive rights. This is a woman. She has a body. Her body has been revered for millennia. But never studied properly. Ever. Not like men's bodies, not by medicine, not by science. Her body is too mysterious, too complex, too hormonal. In pain. Pain is normal. Oh, it really hurts. Take a pill. Irregular periods. Go on the pill. Your periods have stopped. Try a different pill. Want a baby? You're too young to worry about fertility. Have fun. Any babies yet? Don't wait too long. Still trying. Silly girl, you left it too late. Were you having too much fun? Just relax. We try not thinking about it. Frustrated. Don't cry. Why are you so angry? Time of the month. Someone's hormonal. Yes, I am hormonal. We're all hormonal. Our hormones keep us alive. They make us feel alive. They allow us to create life. Our hormones, they impact our strength, our skin, our weight, our emotions, our whole bodies. What do you know so little about them? Now is our time. Time to demystify our bodies. Time to know exactly what's happening under our skin. Time to get answers back by science, not just hope. Science. Eat life. So that's a little introduction to um, what we do as an organization and what we kind of stand for. Um, we've had a lot of stats so far uh, today, and it's been a really interesting breakfast update. Um, but just to kind of summarize, we know from our data research that over 60% of women suffer from a hormonal or gynae issue. And the average time to diagnose such issues is between two and eight years. So we heard about endometriosis earlier, the average time to diagnose endometriosis using the NHS provision that we currently have is eight years. And here at Hertility Health, we can diagnose symptoms of endometriosis within 10 days. So that is what we're designed to do. We're designed to help women understand their bodies. We've worked with over 120,000 customers. And obviously from that, we have a huge data set that we um, use in terms of our research and creating our products. So if you look here, this is the problem. So women have hysteric, hysterically, historically and continue to be excluded from research. So a really interesting stat that we shared the other day was that there is five times more research into erectile dysfunction than PMS, okay, premenstrual syndrome. So erectile dysfunction affects around 19% of the male population and PMS affects around 90% of people who are assigned female at birth. So women traditionally are excluded from research. The other problem is that people are silenced when it comes to their symptoms. And again, we've heard about that. There's a lack of, you know, there's a stigma when talking about menstruation or menopause or infertility or IVF treatment in the workplace. And that's something we kind of want to break down. 
um, people are quitting work because of these symptoms. So one in 10 women are expected to quit work due to their symptoms of menopause, whether that's brain fog, depression, even their physical symptoms of hot flushes. One in 10 women are due to quit work and the menopause, the average starting age of the menopause is 45. I don't know if we can afford to lose one in 10 of our 45 plus women um, from our workforces at the moment. Women are also uniquely affected by systemic barriers when it comes to their health care. So as I said, we love a stat. Um, I don't know if you know this one, but until 2022, medical students were educated at red brick universities across the UK using only male skeletons. I think that's mind blowing. How has nobody thought about that before 2022? Why are our doctors learning about our bodies by using a male skeleton, which is somewhat different to a female anatomy? So I like stats anyway. Some more stats, fantastic, right. So as we've talked about, one in 10 women have endometriosis. One in seven heterosexual couples experience infertility. Uh, one in three women experience reproductive health problems, but under half seek any help. One in 10 women have PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome that we've already discussed today. 58% of women can't access menopause services, despite every woman going through it during their lives. And two in three of us have at least one hormone out of range that could be affecting our fertility. So what's the solution? Well, fertility is the solution, funny enough. So we are revolutionizing reproductive health care. We're radically transforming reproductive health support. And we do that through at-home testing. We do digital diagnostics, and we also provide telemedicine support. So I just wanted to talk to you through the little bit, a little bit about what we provide as an organization. So as you can see, we start with a virtual health assessment, which is done on our website. And this is a bespoke kind of questionnaire that people can fill out. Um, and that gives details of any symptoms they're suffering with, anything that they need help with, and a little bit about their lifestyle. You're then sent a bespoke at-home health assessment kit, which is a blood collection vial, which is done through a fingerprint, finger prick health, uh, blood collection. You fill up your tube of blood, you pop it in the post and you send it back to our lab. They do a bespoke analysis of your blood, of your hormone and your fertility health, and you get digital personalized results within 10 days. And all of our results are written by our team of private gynecologists. You then get your results back and you also have access to highly rated UK experts and clinics. We offer things like scanning, we offer follow-ups, we offer nutritional support, fertility counseling. It's the whole service. And we have a community of care. So whether that's our online community, whether that's in-person events, um, we have a huge kind of care support process. And we also offer training and policy, education and awareness. So as we've heard earlier, you know, a lot of companies and organizations don't have menstruation policies. They don't have menopause policies. They don't have menopause champions. They don't have IVF and fertility policies. And that's where we're here to help. However, policies are not enough. And you can tell I haven't written this slide myself because I am an employee relations, uh, that's my background. So I love a policy. So by saying the words policies are not enough makes me feel a bit unwell, but policies aren't enough. We are revolutionizing healthcare for everybody. And we're doing that by helping organizations become reproductively responsible. And this is a certification similar to a Times Top 100 employer, um, similar to a Investors in People accreditation. It's the same kind of level as that so we offer reproductive health screening so that's through our at-home hormone testing that I've talked through already um, and we offer a proactive approach and that prevents costly treatments we do CPD accredited educational workshops and they're tailored with world-renowned scientific experts and this um, comes from in inclusive family forming support for example uh, menopause education um, fertility education things like that and we also, like I said, do policy implementation. So we make meaningful change by introducing reproductive policies, facilities, and support networks. And by doing all three of those aspects, 
um, organizations have the opportunity to become reproductively responsible. Um, I don't know if we've seen in the news recently, but obviously Channel 4 has joined us on our reproductively responsible journey, and that's really exciting. So this is not only good for your people, but it's great for your business. Um, we, you know, gender diverse companies have been shown to be more innovative, agile and profitable. Um, and it's through these kind of following metrics that I'll talk through that's really going to help. So we improve DNI and ESG metrics. So we attract, support and re retain a more diverse workforce. Uh, we attract and retain top talent. Um, we want your companies to be the company everybody wants to work for and nobody wants to leave um, by offering progressive benefits and an inclusive culture. Um, I don't know how people are finding uh, recruitment at the moment, but it's a tough world out there. And there was a recent survey that uh, talked to over 12,000 people and asked them what they wanted from their jobs. The first one was pay. Um, and unless anybody can find a magic money tree, that's quite difficult just to suddenly increase. And then the second one was um, health and well-being benefits that suit them. So we're here to help you with that. Um, we can boost engagement and productivity. So if you prioritize employee well-being, um, you see a six times return in investment in reduced presenteeism, absenteeism and turnover, and your workforce is healthier and happier. You can be reproductively responsible. Um, so for progressive employers, you don't, you, you don't need just to be menopause or fertility friendly. That's not enough. We need to support our staff with the at-home health assessments, our CPD accredited education and policy support. We offer proactive fertility support. So support your employees to proactively manage their reproductive health rather than working through their most reproductive times of their lives and then pro provide them with reactive benefits such as egg freezing, which is what some of the big companies are doing at the moment. They're offering um, financial support to help their colleagues freeze their eggs. Um, and also gender equality at all levels. We want to support women from menstruation through to menopause um, to ensure that we have an inclusive representation from young talent to senior leaders and thereby smashing the glass ceiling and reducing the gender pay gap. So, you know, no small feat at all. So that's the end of my short presentation. Um, I didn't know if we have any questions or um, appreciate we're kind of at time, but I don't know if anybody had any questions or or if we wanted to go from there. Uh, thank you, Ali. Well, I think um, it maybe it takes a little bit of uh, time for the uh, questions to uh, filter through. So I'll start with the questions that we've had as we've been as we've been talking. And if uh, people uh, out there do have more questions, then please uh, feel free to uh, add them on the on the Q and A. So the first question uh, we had is: if someone is entering the last stage of a redundancy program and were rated lower than their peers then in forms of pregnancy, would they have to get the role on offer? Um, and I think, I mean, by all means, uh, feel free to uh, jump in anyone else uh, on that. But it, if this is in a situation where you are uh, now, where we're under the current legislation, not the, um, uh, the the legislation that Jake was talking about, and you're not on uh, maternity uh, leave, and uh, and there was no knowledge of that pregnancy or no evidence of the, of knowledge of that pregnancy having influenced the scores beforehand, then that that person wouldn't uh, be entitled to the role. The priority that is afforded to the um, pregnant worker as a matter of law uh, arises when you're on mat leave and if there is suitable alternative employment. So if there was an alternative position, then you wouldn't need to go through a competitive process in order to get that alternative uh, role. Uh, I, I hope that that answers the uh, the question. I don't know, if, uh, Jake or Claire, if there's anything that you want to tell, or, or Ali indeed, whether, whether anyone wants to add anything to that please feel free. And if there um, isn't... I think it's just worth adding as well that in terms of the actual new proposed law, um, they haven't actually set out the exact protections. Um, so Time frame, of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's one of those sort of caveats that it is difficult to answer. <laughs> the well, yeah, it certainly would be, yeah. What, what, well, we'll know when the new law, when the new laws are in, but, but at this stage, that that's the position. Uh, the next one is if you have a disability and take... Uh, sick days, they would count towards uh, sick days. So why would this be different? 
Um, I think that might have been a question uh, that perhaps came up as you were speaking, Claire. I, I, I think here the issue is around if you have a disability and you take sick days and the sick days relate to the disability, um, then it's possible that they would that they might not count if it were that it's a reasonable adjustment to dis to discount. <laughs> There's a lot of counts in there uh, to discount the uh, those disability related sick days. Uh, that doesn't mean that it that there wouldn't necessarily I mean it's only if, if that amounts to a reasonable adjustment. So again, I, I know that there, these are. There's not lots of detail, and I wouldn't expect it on a on a live Q and A. But again, I hope that that answers that question. And then uh, the last question that I, we have on uh, here, certainly for now, are there protections for those who suffer multiple miscarriages, which can result in many sick days and has a psychological impact? Um, are there protections? Uh, well, just in the same way, I think that I, I described the protections or the, the the lack of specific protection that's available um, for people undergoing IVF treatment. The same is true, really, of uh, people who are undergoing who who have um, suffered uh, miscarriages or or multiple miscarriages uh, that could result in sick days and psychological impact. I mean, there, there might there might well be protection, just as with uh, infertility, that it that it's the psychological impact that might receive the that might give the protection. Uh, it might be that if there is an underlying physical or mental impairment which uh, uh, affects the miscarriages, then that might be uh, give rise to um, protection. I think that the only other movement that there is in relation to the uh, to miscarriage uh, is uh, another um, private member's bill, which is to extend that protection because um, miscarriages occur before, technically before 24 weeks. Again, somebody feel free to jump in and correct me if, if, I, if I'm wrong on that, before 24 weeks. And so the protections aren't there that you might have um, if there is then a birth or a still still birth after that period of time, so there is a there's a private member's bill which um, let me just is the bereavement leave and pay stillborn and miscarried babies bill um, that I think in terms of its timing is is a, is ahead of uh, the infertility legislation in terms of its progress through Parliament. So at the moment. Um, similar in its in the profile of protection to to what I described on uh, on IVF. Um, so doing our again, anyone anyone wanted to chip in anything else on that? Fine, we'll take that then as read. Um, <laughs> um, and so I, I know we've run slightly over. Thank you, uh, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm assured by technology that you're out there, and I hope that you've um, found that um, really useful. As, um, as Ellen has said, we'll be sending out the slides, and that will give the, the uh, contact details for all of us, including Ali. Uh, we're really grateful to uh, Ali for, uh, for doing a talk, um, which yeah, it was really informative and, uh, and hopefully will be really useful to you in terms of all of the resources. Uh, that they have. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope you're not too affected by the snow. And if you have to travel anywhere, then uh, then you do that safely. And uh, we hope to speak to you all soon. Many thanks.